It's my uh, pleasure today to introduce our speaker this month for the month. And uh, her name is Dr. Priya Natarajan. She's a professor of astronomy and physics at Yale University and also the director of Yale's Frankie Program in Science and the Humanities. She is an accomplished scientist with deep interdisciplinary interests and experience. She's well known around the world as an award-winning and elite astrophysicist who, whose expertise spans a number of subspecialties, including dark matter and black holes. And today she'll be highlighting some of her current work in these areas. As of this year, Priya has also joined the leadership team of the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard, which of course is one of JTF's flagship MPS investments and co-funded with the Moore Foundation. The Black Hole Initiative aims to probe the limits of our scientific understanding by focusing on these strange places in the universe, black holes, where our existing concepts begin to fail and new concepts are needed. This is the kind of science that can quickly become philosophical, not only because we have to rethink our theoretical concepts, but also because our methods of inquiry and inference become tricky. That's why it's of so much interest to us here at the John Templeton Foundation. And with all of this in mind, Priya is also going to tell us about some of the challenges in methodology and frankly, philosophy that she's been addressing pre uh, uh, frequently and recently. So uh, with that, Priya, welcome to our speaker series and the Zoom floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Matt, for that very generous uh, introduction. And I just want to say what a privilege and a pleasure it is to have this opportunity to uh, share some new discoveries, new ideas, and um, you know, sort of ways of thinking that me, my research group, and collaborators have been investing a lot of time and energy uh, recently. I really wish I could be there and I wasn't on the Zoom floor, but that is deferred for another time. So uh, may I go ahead and share my screen? Okay, so um, I have titled my talk, uh, Paradigms, Anomalies and Discoveries, um, and in, within the frame of understanding how science works. And uh, what I want to talk to you uh, about today are sort of a reframing and a rethinking of science itself, uh, the practice of science and what we um, actually contend the content of sciences, what constitutes valid science and how we arrive at that. And I think these, um, to borrow from uh, JTF, these are some of the essential sort of foundational questions. And for me, they have been brought into sharper focus because of the scientific work that I do. And that's what I want to share with you today to show you how the new questions that exciting discoveries are opening up. They open up ever new questions. And those questions are now sort of hitting against the walls of the limitations of the ways in which we have posed these questions and the methods that we use to probe the universe. So I will talk a little bit about two exciting science results that open up this sort of a new class of questions and have actually torqued our understanding of what are the valid methods for discovery, what are the modes of inquiry and method methodologies that we use. And then I wanna talk a little bit about the implications of these for our understanding of the nature of inference, causation and correlation, because in physics and astrophysics, we believe since we have access to nature's order, we have access to physical laws that are obeyed everywhere, thankfully in the universe, that we have a leg up compared to computer science and other fields where they're looking at problems where there aren't these kinds of grand arching principles. But I wanna show you that even here, although we can harness the power of machine learning, there are some interesting limits that we hit. And then I want to conclude with trying to understand um, that, you know, science needs uh, serious rethinking as a methodological frame. It's the best frame that we have to understand nature. 
but it could do with a bit of revision. And I think what I wanna talk about specifically there is this kind of combination of content and context of science, which was believed to be completely cleaved in the past. And that's an artificial distinction. And I'll show you how there are new ways of thinking about bringing the context back. Scientific discoveries never happen in a vacuum. They come out of a particular milieu and context. And then I wanna talk about this sort of perception that values are somehow sitting somewhere else and not within the domain of intellectual inquiry. And I, I will show you that the very questions we ask in science, why we ask them, who asks them, who decides they are science, has everything to do with values. And I think we are realizing that now. And you know, really kind of flesh out, hopefully, if I have time, a little bit more, this collision of objectivity and the objective and the subjective. So first I wanna talk about two new um, exciting discoveries. Um, so I work on trying to understand the nature of dark matter using the bending of light. So large concentrations of matter in the universe as showed in, shown in this little schematic slide here on the, on the left um, cause the bending of light and therefore distortions in the observed shapes of background galaxies. So any foreground matter, lumps of matter, in this case, mostly dark matter, actually cause distortions in the real shapes that we actually end up seeing. So we end up seeing distorted shapes and in the process of undoing the distortion, we are able to figure out the details spatial distribution of the matter that caused the distortion in the first place. And the reason we are able to do that is thankfully, most of the, uh, most of the universe has dark matter very lightly smeared. And there are very small regions that have concentrations of dark matter that severely bend light. So we have a reference of places in the universe where we see the undistorted shapes of galaxies. So we have that as a prior. So when we see distortions, we know there are lumps of matter. So a lot of my work over the years has involved this detailed spatial mapping. So you know, I'm kind of obsessed with mapping in general and this process of you know, epistemically what mapping really is. I mean, I believe that mapping is knowing. Um, and so you, I've been able to um, sort of produce these huge sort of very high, uh, high resolution detail maps of how dark matter is clumped. And it's clumped just because of gravity. It doesn't have any other interactions, which is why it's, it has been so difficult to find dark matter. And remember in all of this puzzle, right? We don't know the particle nature of dark matter. All we know is that clumps of it aggregate. They are so massive, they constitute the dominant matter component of the universe. So over the past two decades, I've been working in this field on cluster lensing, which is the deflection caused by uh, these large aggregates of visible matter around which you have scaffolding of dark matter. And you know, having developed the methodology, so it's sort of been a slow march. And as the data has gotten better, we are able to do more and more. So you see in the bottom panels, the kind of topographic maps, cartographic maps of dark matter that we can now make. And the one you see on the right is the highest resolution one ever made uh, to date. And of course, you know, the telescope that has, you know, it's all about ideas and instruments kind of, you know, uh, congealing. And the instrument that has really facilitated my entire career have been actually two space telescopes, right? The Hubble Space Telescope, and else, as you'll see in a little bit, the Chandra Space Telescope for black holes. So um, one of the key predictions of cold dark matter, the model, which is highly successful, independently verified by observations on many scales, cosmic microwave background, galaxies, clustering of galaxies, and so on, fairly well est established paradigm that is consistent with um, many, many wavelengths, data and many wavelengths. It makes very concrete predictions about how dark matter should clump and how it should be, how the sub clumps should be radially distributed. So we have a lot of tests that are permissible if we can make really high resolution maps. And so that's what we proceeded to do with my uh, research group and collaborators uh, a couple of years ago. So we mapped this, uh, these very high resolution clusters, and then we were able to compare with simulations that offer um, analogs from the cold dark matter theory predictions of what the clumping properties of dark matter should look like in clusters. 
So, and I, you may ask, I mean, uh, okay, cold dark matter. The reason is the nature of dark matter is actually telegraphed in the spatial distribution. You can see this visually in the two panels that you see in the top. The panel that you see sort of in the middle on the left is cold dark matter, very clumpy. And those light spots are actually dark matter. It's mocked up to look like light, but it's actually dark matter. So you see that, you know, uh, cold dark matter is extremely clumpy. It predicts a lot of little lumps and lots of crud. Whereas another kind of dark matter particle, say warm dark matter, which you see on the right-hand panel, that is much, much smoother. So even just a counting exercise will help you uh, understand and rule out one kind of dark matter. So that's the kind of work that we've been doing, but now you can go beyond counting. You can actually go and look at the internal properties of, uh, of um, the lumps and clumps. So we first saw an anomaly that showed up in the radial distribution. So you can see in the radial distribution, there was an anomaly. But we saw this anomaly that in simulations, these dark matter clumps are not as centrally concentrated as the data suggests from lensing, from our lensing map. Although one thing we found that works is the total number. So that's what you see in the lower plot. In the gray is the comparison from simulations. The red is the data from this Hubble lensing. So while the actual numbers matched, the radial distributions of where the clumps end up according to cold dark matter theory and what we see in the universe does not match. So then we started probing a little bit deeper and we found there's another thing that doesn't match. And that's a big, I mean, there's another huge mismatch. And so here, what you see, I mean, the technical details don't matter. A lot of, you know, a lot of this kind of finding is just visually obvious. So I think that's what is so nice about lensing work that you don't need to know all the technical background and you just visually see what's going on. So on the top, you see a reconstruction of the strength of lensing that a real cluster, Hubble Space Telescope image cluster mo mass model. So we construct these models, as I said, you invert and figure out. And the bottom is an analog, exact analog in terms of mass and other properties of a simulated cluster. And you can see visually already they don't match. So the little, the little um, sub halos, the little substructure, little, uh, points that you see, you see in nature, they are much more concentrated. These are bigger, they're more numerous. And that is within this frame, this sort of uh, frame. And here you can see that you don't have as many and they're not as pronounced. They look like smaller specks, right? It turns out that this translates into something that you can convert into a lensing efficiency on small scale. So, you know, how strongly concentrated the matter is. And you find a factor of 10 discrepancy. So in the orange is what the simulations predict. And in the purple coal colder lines are what the data are suggesting. So there's a huge gap here. And there's only two possible explanations for this gap, it turns out. So we did an exhaustive study over a couple of years. This was published in Science last year. And so what we found is there are only two possible explanations that could account for this and bridge this gap. One is we are missing something fundamental in the simulations, i.e. in how we are performing them methodologically, we are missing modeling. What you put in is what you get out of the simulation. So we are missing an astrophysical process that fundamentally transforms these uh, lumps of dark matter, which are associated with galaxies when they fall into these very, very uh, dense environments. Or, of course, the more exciting possibility, maybe you know, we've made some incorrect assumption about the nature of dark matter, right? So, I mean, I'm agnostic to it, but this is a major sort of, you know, um, a turning point in terms of the directions of research where we need to investigate much, much further. So as you all know, right, um, um, it's a, a cosmology is very exciting, but there's also this weird paradox that we have, that there's some fundamental insurmountable epistemic limits, right? So we cannot perform control experiments. So, um, and what you see uh, in uh, phenomena is what you have. The statistical, we are inside the universe, you know, we're really in a, uh, not in a great situation from our traditional understanding of science and scientific experiments. And then there are some surmountable limits that have to do with the tools and the model building and the assumptions and the priors that we make, which are surmountable. 
And of course, in the absence of being able to do controlled experiments, simulations have really been um, served as mediators. And as I have argued, they're actually ex epistemic arbitrators and they serve much like a new kind of universal language that can validate, not only explicate, help visualize, compute in the nonlinear regimes and reveal emergent phenomena, but also mediate between explanation, evidence, and prediction. They play a fundamental role in, uh, in fields like cosmology. And, and I think there is sort of this feedback loop between simulations. And as you all know, the um, EHT collaboration and the work they did sort of really exemplifies and opens up this relationship. It sort of lays bare this relationship to show, you know, there were all these simulations that they did that matched the EHT image um, uh, that was found. And so, and, you know, simulations were always thought as a tool, like a mere tool, right? And that, you know, that they're not, they don't have the capacity to help us generate new discoveries. Lo and behold, uh, I do now want to give you an example of a case, clear cut case, so, you know, EHT was one case, a clear cut case, which is sort of much more um, sort of well defined uh, and cleaner to understand is the case of, um, a, you know, of wandering black holes. And so simulations have ad actually generated discovery. They have revealed this population that we did not know existed. And we are seeing the first hints observationally um, uh, of the existence of this population. And you know, no one ever believed that simulation, uh, simulators would be generators. And I wanna talk briefly about why it is that suddenly simulations, and it's not just about resolution and size of simulations. It is also, as I mentioned, our prior assumptions and the inputs, what inputs we give for a simulation to get started that are best, that are informed by our best current understanding, right? And sometimes inadvertently, we limit ourselves, we limit discovery space because we do not dare to relax some of these assumptions. So I wanna show you this example um, of um, the case of the detection of a wandering population of black holes. And then once this, this sort of, this thing gets cracked open and you've sort of opened up this new space to direct observational um, multivalent observations to find these uh, objects, this population, then you see that there's a new role that is emerging for simulations that has to do with the expected data dilute. So I'll sort of jump from how simulations have been generative and then how they can help us and then what the limits are. So, you know, you know, while I'm very enthusiastic about all the methodologies that we have, you know, thanks to my sort of, you know, background in the history and philosophy of science, I'm always cognizant of the limits the limits that our methods impose on what we can come up with, the frames that we can think and model with, right? So here's the a first case study is, you know, looking at the um, study of formation of growth of black holes. And these, as I said, these are very, very sophisticated now, but we had a key input assumption. Because we cannot really model black holes with great fidelity, we model them as point particles. And because we know that uh, black holes, central supermassive black holes occupy the inner regions of most galaxies, if not all, they were pinned forcefully to the center. So black holes were forced to sit at the center of galaxies when we formed them and so on. If you relax that assumption, which is what this new code allows you to do, in order to relax that assumption, you actually need to have resolution. You need to have a large number of particles. So you needed that sort of the technical breakthrough to be able to relax this assumption. But when you do, you discover something absolutely fantastic. So before I show you what you discovered, let me show you some wonderful slices of simulations to give you a feel of what these simulations are like. So these are all slices from the Romulus suite of simulations. These are the simulations that uh, me and my research group have worked with. We analyze them. Um, we've analyzed them, tried to understand them, interpret them. They were performed by the N-Body shop at the University of Washington. So what you just see on the left-hand panel is just dark matter. So it's the same simulation giving you 
two different views. One, you're seeing only the dark matter and you can see all the clustering. You can see all the stuff that I just talked to you about in the lensing, sort of uncovering the spatial distribution. And you can see the evolution of the same region on the right-hand side now, but now you are not seeing the dark matter. That's not visualized. You're seeing instead the stars and the gas. You're seeing all the baryons, you know, the 4% in the universe. Um, and you're seeing that view of the same spot. And you see a completely different picture, different kinds of activity. And what you see in red is energy that is being distributed where the gas is getting heated. So you see sort of these cold blue clumps where stars form and you have galaxies that are falling in in that region. And you see simultaneously the thermal history of what is going on. So obviously any physical explanation has to reconcile both of these views because they're happening simultaneously, right? These dynamics are happening. The uh, dark matter is the scaffolding and the cocoon in which all of this activity is happening. So now let's zoom further in to understand the role of black holes and what can we do right now? So this is a zoom in of the formation and the assembly of an individual large galaxy. By today, it would end up being a central bright galaxy like M87 uh, in the Virgo cluster that the uh, Event Horizon Telescope people have um, helped image for us. And so here you see the assembly process, right? So I've zoomed in, you're seeing all the gas. Once again, you're not seeing um, the uh, dark matter here. It's not visualized. And I want you to focus, what we are focusing there is on the black hole activity. So you are seeing the black hole in the center. I don't know if you can see it, it's flickering. So it's actually feeding. So we are modeling the feeding of the black hole, the episodic feeding of the black hole that you can see as gas is falling in with little galaxies that are being swallowed. Some of them are being swallowed followed straight up, some are getting captured, coming back around. And so the gas feeding is altering, it's stochastic, it's not predictable, it's random, and that's what we are seeing. So this is very much part of the physics, right? So while there are these regular correlations and uh, things that we see between physical properties, there actually are it's a lot of stochasticity, which is why we need the simulations in the first place. So what did this uncover? So in Romulus, lifting this limitation of pinning black holes down, you discover what you just saw was, um, you know, the assembly history of the leftmost galaxy. It's a spiral galaxy and it's littered with black holes. What you see there marked in arrows are little black holes, black holes above the mass of 10 to the six. That's a quirk of how we do the seeding in these simulations, but just notice how many black holes there are. And it's a, a result of that crashing in process that you saw lots of little galaxies. So these are three different, but not every galaxy. I am stressing the stochasticity and the randomness. So these are three different galaxies that have a different number of black holes. You know, the one on the right-hand side is the most copious distribution. And there are other galaxies that have fewer black holes, but they all have off-center black holes. And so we've now written a couple of papers about how to detect this population um, and so on. So part of the challenge in trying to understand the growth history of black holes, which is the other problem that, I've, um, that you know, I'm extremely interested and invested in, is that we have an incomplete sampling of observables. So what we really want to know is build a growth history over cosmic time. So we need to see the earliest black holes that present themselves in their feeding phases as quasars. But we see only the brightest ones because they are far away. So that's incomplete data. We are trying to understand the population and its properties by it's like trying to understand human evolution by only looking at the very tall Dutch, right? So you would really not get a good view of the overall height distribution around the world if you focus on a, a preferentially taller part of the uh, population. So what we have found is in order to deal with the data, we really now need to go beyond just building sort of analytic models. And, we, um, and to do this, uh, we need to harness the power of machine learning, but there are real challenges. So what I, uh, you know, what I want to just uh, mention briefly, because I wanna close uh, quickly with, you know, what's the overall sort of, what is the tenor of the questions that have emerged from all of this scientific work? So what we've done is we've created this new sort of uh, research platform that actually co-locates simulations and observational data. As you saw, the simulations are central to inference, right? And so machine learning can help us. We can make simulations in small boxes with high resolution. Machine learning will allow us to replicate 
populate black holes in larger simulations that have dark matter only, don't have the physics, so they are computationally much faster. And, and they also will allow us to reproduce observed volumes. So we can survey just like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So I think that's um, uh, this is available on a platform, and this is a project that, that I started with a research group put together at Google X. Um, and this is in preparation. So there are limits to what we are doing here, as you have all heard about algorithms, right? Algorithms are limited. Machine learning is limited by the training set. You train the algorithm on a set of outcomes, and then you ask it to expand to a larger volume in this case of simulations. So, um, so you know, we are looking at very, very interesting limits that, you know, have to uh, do with uh, causation, cause and effect. And, um, um, and you know, what, what, we have, what we've really hit against um, are the limits of causal inference. How, you know, and the reason for that is that even though we have physical laws that help us understand and connect cause and effect in fundamental ways, um, machine learning methodologies are inherently limited. So one of the activities that, you know, uh, I've been involved in is involving um, across disciplines, scholars from many different disciplines who are battling with the inference problem, connecting cause to effect and understanding if the correlations that we see actually have deeper causes, causes that are actually parlayed by laws and principles that we don't yet have access to. So what are the undiscovered laws and regularities? So we've had a very rich series of discussions and talks bringing people from multiple disciplines. Right now, the two two and two, three disciplines where the challenges are very similar are biology, where now we have data at the genomic level, we have data at the chemical molecular level, connecting that then with the virus and how it enters bodies and what it does. So these kind of connections, the inference, the cause and effects that you have to map for that very complex problem. So it's been very exciting talking to people who are at the forefront in this colloquium series on, for example, mapping uh, COVID. And on the other hand, we have people who are working in the social sciences who are doing agent simulation, trying to model the collective behavior of human beings, how people are going. And so that's, once again, there, there are very similar limitations to the ones that we have with astrophysical uh, uh, data. So that's an ongoing project. I'm very, very excited about it. And we are hoping to actually pull together what we've learned uh, uh, and actually present it and share that um, uh, uh, with uh, more broadly with uh, scholars and, and the public. So I think one of the, um, so what this has all brought me to um, is the point of, you know, we really need what it has brought into focus for me are, you know, the limits of science as we practice it. So, you know, there is science, which is a set of rules, a framework, and then there is science as we practice. They have always been a little disjointed. The presentations, the narratives of science that scientists often um, offer are very sanitized. They really don't kind of, you know, the messiness, the wrong turns, um, the disasters, uh, they are never part of the narrative. Whereas science, you learn very iteratively from all those failed, you know, discoveries are not always about individual eureka moments. To get to that moment, there's a lot that has to happen. So, you know, there's been a social constructivist critique of science that really said that, you know, science has been inattentive. This was, you know, part of the science force. Those of you who are roughly my age group would know that when I was in college, this was the big controversy, the sort of the clash between the science and the humanities. And then, and that led to a crop of young people then, people like me, who felt compelled to be bilingual, who felt they had to be interdisciplinary. There's no way out because we could see that the new discoveries, the exciting discoveries in science would really come from between disciplines and you know, really sharply defined disciplinary boundaries would actually constrain and restrict possibilities for discovery. So I think the context and the content of science are deeply intertwined. They are actually not separable. And in sort of my thinking is that 
the place where we can see this kind of coupling, this deep enmeshing is in the process of acceptance of radical scientific ideas. And these are the spaces. So when does an idea and an experimental result, how and when does it actually become accepted scientific fact? Is it is adjudicated by a process of consensus among scientists, right? And there are ways of demonstrating the validity of experiments, and in our case, often using simulations uh, in cosmology. And I think this process of acceptance of ideas, which is done by scientific bodies, by groups of scientists internally first before the idea is accepted and presented, that is the place where you have the collision of the subjective and objective. So what, who, who comes up with a radical idea, how they pose the question, what resources they have to actually explore it, all play a part in whether the idea actually gets accepted as scientific fact in the end. And we cannot ignore that anymore um, because we, have, we are seeing and we are paying a price for science not being inclusive in many, many dimensions, not just inclusive as to who gets to do science. That too, of course, that's a huge problem. We all acknowledge it but also inclusive in terms of intellectual approaches, ways to do science. So, you know, we've kind of lurched from the lone male scientific genius to large collaborations. So, you know, there is a plurality of ways to do science, you know, small groups, individuals who take risks, take creative intellectual risks. And, you know, we really need to start paying much more attention to how science is done because it is ricocheted in the discoveries that are made and that will be made. And, and I think we really need to go beyond this notion of dramatic paradigm shifts and revolutions. I mean, the sociologists and philosophers of science have always critiqued Kuhn that it's not just about, it is obviously a combination of evolution and revolution. And, and I think that all of this is really important, especially for people like me, active scientists who are working at the frontier because we are now sadly enmeshed and find ourselves in a world where uh, the belief in science is waning and to great detriment. We saw this completely play out during uh, the COVID epidemic and that provisional as, as science is uncertain as it is because all our measurements are limited by uncertainties, by our instruments, the fidelity of our instruments, it is the best way forward for understanding nature and understanding our place in the grand scheme of things and to live and prosper and thrive and learn and discover in a very sustainable way in harmony with nature, moving away from the rhetoric of the conquest of nature. And I think I should um, just stop here.